I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We are continuing our study in the Sermon on the Mount. And today I've been asked to speak on divorce and oaths. Divorce and oaths. Let's um, look at the passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 37. And here we have the Lord teaching. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath but keep the oaths that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even uh, make one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no, Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Some years ago, I was driving along Wilston, and I passed a Baptist church with a huge billboard, and I saw the words, marriage, grand. Divorce, 50 grand. Divorce is always costly, financially, and also emotionally. And I'm very surprised these days when I go to a big card shop to buy cards, to notice that next to wedding and engagement cards, you have a section called divorce card. Do you know that? I picked up a divorce card to see what on earth uh, they have to, to share with people who are divorced. And the card said something like this, think of your marriage as a record album. Then you have to sing duets. Now you are a release single. <laughs> Enjoy your solos. A pastor friend of mine was talking to a young girl just after a wedding, and he said to her, hey, you've seen your auntie getting married? Would you like to get married and live happily after? She said, no. So my friend was very surprised. What do you mean, no? He said, well, Pastor, this is the story. At marriage, they're supposed to be very happy, living happily after, but I don't want to get married because, like them, I will sadly divorce. So some people are very afraid to get married because divorce, separation is so common. In this country, two out of five marriages end in divorce. That figure has not risen for 10 to 12 years but not surprisingly, because most people don't get married. They just cohabit. They live together. And no divorces are therefore reported. But can you imagine the pain, the trauma that accomplish all these uh, separation? But this morning, we want to ask ourselves, what is Jesus' view on divorce? What is his attitude? What is his perspective? What does he have to say about divorce? And are his words relevant to us today? Now, some of us have been watching courtroom drama. And when you watch these drama, you always see the uh, defendant uh, appearing, putting his hand or her hand on a Bible and saying these words after the court clerk, I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. You've seen that happening, haven't you? Then in Matthew 5, which we read, Jesus says, do not swear at all, either by heaven or by the earth. What does that mean? Does it mean that when we go to court, when we are asked to uh, put our hands on the Bible to declare that whatever we testify would be according to the truth, we can't do that? What about going before an attorney, a lawyer, a commissioner of oath, and having to kind of swear an affidavit to say that we are that person or that we will do this or do that. Is that not allowable? 
So what is Jesus' perspective on oaths? But first, let's look at Jesus and divorce. Jesus and divorce. The divorce, the issue of divorce, was a hot potato in Jesus' day. There were heated discussions about uh, when a man can divorce his wife. And um, they don't have television. They don't have lots of uh, theatres in the days of Jesus. But at night, people would gather around for discussion. And these discussions are very, very lively. It's almost like a boxing match. So you go to a town or a village, you find there almost a kind of a discussion ring, boxing ring. And so the announcer will say, in the blue corner, Rabbi Shammai. Everybody would clap. And he stands for the conservative consistently conservative and for him marriage is permanent there is no divorce the only exception would be if the man marries his bride and discovers he's not a virgin when divorce is possible then the men will begin to laugh how do you test virginity you know <laughs> they would be laughing away like that and then on the left green corner Rabbi Hillel. Wow, the cheers go up because you see all the audience are men. No women, because if women were there, there would be such great fights. The eyes would be torn out and the hair and clothes as well. So only the men are there. But he receives rapturous deception. Why? Because Hillel was a liberal. And he says, in the teaching of Moses, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, a man can divorce his wife if he finds any indecency in her or anything unfaithful in her, and then he can issue to her a certificate of divorce. Argument? How do you interpret anything indecent? Unfaithful, yes, we understand marital infidelity, but what does indecent mean? Well, according to Rabbi Hillel and his followers, he said, well, is this, you can divorce your wife, man. You can divorce your wife if she burns the toast in the morning. If she keeps nagging at you, or she's like a dripping tap, nagging at you all the time, then you can divorce her. And also, you can divorce her if as she grows older, she becomes plainer and ugly, ugly, plain, then you can divorce her. And all the men would say, wow, that's good, that's good. And they would buy it. So this would go on from village to village, from town hall or town area to town area. Hillel was the favorite and champion of many Jewish men. So when Jesus was preaching Sermon on the Mount and on other occasions as well, his uh, critics were asking him, right, Jesus, What's your view? Whose side are you on? Shammai, the conservative, or Hillel, the liberal? Tell us, and please, give us the reasons as well. So that's how Jesus was teaching on divorce. And he says very clearly, anyone who divorces his wife, according to Moses, must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, what did Jesus mean? And how do we understand the debate? And we need to transport ourselves back almost the first century, to understand the uh, issues behind these statements. Now, in ancient times, whether it be the Jewish uh, culture, race, or other races, the law on marriage and divorce was always weighted against the woman. The woman cannot divorce the husband. The man is the one who can divorce and demand a legal separation from his wife. This happens in all kinds of cultures in the first century and even uh, earlier on. But in the Jewish case, there is a kind of safeguard. You must give her a written document. In some cultures, I better not mention some names, but even today, in some religion, a man can say, 
three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and you are divorced without any document, without any verification, authentication, whatever. But in the Jewish um, culture, you can't do that. Can you just imagine a husband coming home drunk? He's been to the pub and had too many whiskeys. And he comes, oh, my goodness, that was a wife. And the wife was trying to scold him and say, why you get drunk again? He says, I divorce you. I divorce you. I divorce you. And the poor girl is divorced. Now, now Moses says, you can't do that. You have to go to the elders. They have to issue a certificate, a bill of divorce. So at least you just can't divorce somebody, your wife, on a whim or a fancy, or when you are insane or drunk. But let's say that you have said, yep, yeah, I'm going to divorce her, I can't stand her anymore, and you have this certificate of divorce signed by the elders of the village or the town. What happens? Jesus said, look, you've made that woman very vulnerable. Where does she go? Sometimes her parents may live miles and miles away, and when she goes back to a village, she can be stigmatized and rejected and so on. And what do you do? This poor girl has nowhere to go. And in order to get boarding and lodging, she has to find a man who would welcome her, who would marry her. So this girl is being forced, if you like, to flirt, to look sexy or whatever it is. How do you do sexy? I don't know. Uh, so that the man will be attracted to her. You get it? So Jesus says, look, that's very cruel. And you're forcing that person, the woman, to commit adultery? No. Now, of course, he did say, if it's a case of extremity, if supposing the woman just deserted the man, or she is terribly promiscuous, immoral, that's another case. Maybe, maybe uh, divorce could be permitted. But in most cases, the answer was no. But you must understand about the Sermon on the Mount. It's about the word law. Colin referred to this about two weeks ago, to verse 17, where Jesus said, that, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Wow. The law has so much authority. How do we interpret it? Jesus says, I didn't come to uh, abolish the Mosaic law. I came to fulfill it, to give it a deeper meaning. And lots of people get into trouble because they don't understand law. When we talk about Torah or law, for us, it means Old Testament law. But if you examine Old Testament law carefully, you find that there are different categories or sections. For example, there is the Jewish uh, rites, how many feasts are there? Three feasts normally. And uh, what are the religious obligations of the worshipper? So when you go to the temple or a kind of synagogue or something, you have to bring with you lambs for sacrifice or goats and sometimes even bulls. And the priest has to be ready in his clothing and his knife has to be very sharp to, 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 to kill the animal before your eyes. And there should be a basin to take the blood, and then you should burn this animal on the altar and so on, and there are detailed prescription on offerings. The animal itself has to be a one-year-old lamb without blemish and so on. So there are regulations, there are rituals and so on. And then if you look at the uh, rules on hygiene, there are many of them. Because in, remember, uh, God's people at that time were wandering through the wilderness and uh, there were laws on how do you spot leprosy? Uh, how do you make sure that it's not rashes, but it's leprous and so on? Or when a house has mildew, it should be condemned. It should be cleaned completely. Otherwise, nobody could leave there. There are hygienic laws. And also, believe it or not, there are laws on where to pee and where to poo. And it's given theological thing. Okay, you don't just poo and pee in the open like some cultures still do today. Why? Because God is watching over the camp. So make sure you dig up something, okay? Make a, take a spade with you 
whenever you want to uh, do your thing, do your business. So there are laws on hygiene. And there are laws on food as well. So let me ask you, supposing you say, I want to obey the law, take the law at its surface uh, level. How many of you here eat pork? Hey, come on, I mean, so few? How many of you eat pork, enjoy pork chops and pork filet and so on? Better still, okay. I, I thought we got honest people in uh, EEC. How many of you love to eat prawns and lobsters? Oh, that's better. I do. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, we've just broken the law. <laughs> Awful. Oh, you've broken the law because it's forbidden. You can't eat pork. Right? You can't eat fish. You can't eat uh, shark. Uh, I mean, the, the, the fish with, uh, with no scales. And you also cannot eat prawn and, and lobsters and so on because it's there in the law. How come you're doing it? And then there are also civil law. And it tells you you can't marry certain relatives. You, know, uh, you can't marry your stepmother or your stepfather. You can't marry your brother or your sister or even first cousins, uncles, aunts, stepmother, and so on. You can't do that. Civil laws. And then also dress. There's a strong dress code. Okay, how many of you women are wearing trousers this morning or normally wear jeans? How many of you? Ladies? Again, you've broken the law. Because Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 15, and they did still do it in Nigeria in some churches, if you wear men's clothing, you have sinned. You've broken the law. Shame on you. <laughs> Jesus has come to fulfill the law. You mean Jesus is not for jeans? No, women wearing jeans? You mean Jesus is against people who eat pork and lobsters and so on? Does it mean that? Then uh, there's also um, uh, the understanding. Look, uh, how did Jesus fulfill the law? But we know he fulfilled the ritual law, the law of sacrifices, because he was the Lamb of God. He was the high priest, even though he didn't come from the tribe of Levi, from the type of Judah. He is after the order of Melchizedek. He is our great high priest and the one who brings us into God's presence. But he was the full, perfect sacrifice for sin. He fulfilled that law. And then he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, remember all the arguments over how to keep the Sabbath? He's Lord over the Sabbath. You can do good things on the Sabbath. You don't have to obey all those rigid laws about how long you should walk, whether taking your false teeth out is work or not work. <laughs> so Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he has fulfilled that. And again, civil laws, well, in those days, they're living under Roman government, rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God, the things that are God. But then, we have to be very careful because I see some Christians, even those in our church, who say, I'm now under grace. There's no more law. Hallelujah. Now, Paul is saying, you cannot use the law, the works of the law, in order to be justified to get right with God. But some laws still remain in force. What are these laws? All Old Testament principles, laws, that are repeated and endorsed by the apostles, by Jesus in the New Testament, are laws. Jesus is the young ruler, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should honour your father and mother, and so on. Honour your father and mother, Paul repeated that. All those are still law today. They're not broken. The moral laws, the absolute laws of God are still to be kept. So, for example, you can't say as a, a, a parent, you say, okay, uh, you're growing up now, Susie, you're growing up now, Kenny, and you should love each other. And then Susie decides to bite Kenny. Say, ah, no more law about biting, is there, mommy? Just loving, isn't that all? So we have to be careful. Now, of course, laws like when, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? So everyone was waiting Anxiously, which one? Which one? Jesus says, number one. What did he say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, love is the fulfilling of the law, loving God, loving neighbor. Get it? So here, we have to understand this. And I want to suggest to you that what is known as the Mosaic Concession, 
Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, is what I would call civil law. It's not, if you like, absolute law. And again, as you look at, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 24, uh, verse 1. It's very important because this is the uh, text that everybody uh, debates over in the days of Jesus, that even today theologians, Christians like to explore. It says in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, sends off her off from his house, and if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, sends her from the first house or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. Now, if you look at that context, what Moses was trying to say was this, okay, man and wife are married, and then the woman is put away, given a bill of divorce, and she marries another man. And this man presumably marries another man. Now, her second husband also gives her a bill of divorce, a certificate of divorce, all right? And let's say, number one, her first husband also divorces the second wife. And for some strange reason, they fall in love. They want to marry again. The law says you can't do that. It's forbidden. So in other words, you've got to be very serious about your commitments, your marriage commitments. That was the context. So when Jesus was asked, what do you think of divorce? He didn't go along the way of the scribes, teachers of the law, and the Pharisees who tried to interpret using loopholes, all kinds of legal, technical arguments to justify divorce or to have a rigid framework, guidelines on divorce. He didn't do that. What did he do? Let's turn to Matthew 19. And by the way, uh, Sermon on the Mount is very interesting. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, if you read all the three chapters of Matthew 5, 6, 7, it will take you less than 25 minutes. So it's not one sermon. They are different sayings of Jesus. Theologians call it the pericope, extractions from the sayings of Jesus. It's a body of them, which Mark uses, which uh, Luke uses, and Matthew uses. Matthew brought some of these things together. Because you see, this issue of divorce was brought up over and over again. So if you turn to Matthew 19, which is a different context, what do you read? And here we have Jesus' attitude and response to the question of divorce. Uh, Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees, these were the very strict separatists, uh, came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Look at the reply of Jesus. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh so they are no longer two but one therefore what God has joined together let man not separate what did Jesus do? how did he handle the issue of divorce? I want to say brilliantly brilliantly he didn't debate with them discuss with them over divorce per se. He says, have you not read? In other words, don't you know your scripture? Let's not talk about the legality of divorce or the mosaic concession. Let's go back to God's original purpose. Let's return to his authoritative word. Have you not read? And I think we need to do that today. Let's go back to Scripture and see what God's plan is for men and women. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the dawn of creation, the Creator made human beings male and female. Marriage is God's design. God is the one who uh, initiated, provided for man to have a wife. Marriage was his idea. The creator made them male and female. And by the way, 
the world of human beings is not unisex. You might have unisex fashion or even hairdos, but not in the realm of sexuality. Male and female, men and women. I know there are lots of discussion about homosexuality, about civil partnerships, and whether even church can marry people of the same gender, male and male, female and female, but here in Scripture, it's always male and female. God made Adam and Eve, and they come together. God did not make Adam and Steve. <laughs> All right? Male and female. And then let's go on, because we've got to be very positive. For this reason... Because God brought marriage into existence, this partnership, this beautiful union into position. What does it mean? He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So Jesus is saying, when it comes to marriage, it's a commitment, a big commitment. You leave father and mother. Now all your life, especially in uh, the days of the Old Testament and Jesus' day, a lot of single men, single women, live under the shelter, the covering of their parents. They don't live in their own digs or flats. That never happened. You live in your family homes and so on. And all the time you are there, you have to obey mom and dad. But sadly, lots of men are still tied to their mother's apron string. And that's a cause for a lot of divorces. So <laughs> Jesus said to them, first you have to leave. And then you can cleave. Two of you will become one flesh. So marriage is a commitment, serious commitment. You leave the familiar contours of your family surrounding, or your home and so on, and you become a new unit. You become one flesh. And one flesh speaks of sexuality. You have sexual union, intercourse, and that's blessed by God. Now, many, Christ many non-Christians have accused us Christians of being prudes, that somehow we are not delighted by sex and so on. And I want to say there's a lie. Now, one of the books that talk about married love, and in the old days, you can only read that book. It's in the Bible. You can only read it when you're 40 years old and above. You know what that book is? The Song of Solomon, Canticles, Song of Songs. And there, it just celebrates married love. Wow. It explicitly talks about love, sexual love and so on. So I know tonight what you're going to read. It's okay. God will bless you when you read that book. And I want to tell you from here, especially those of you who are young people and even older people, sex is a gift from God. Anyone says amen? amen? Well, you're not very sure. Sex is a beautiful gift from God. Who's going to say amen? 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 amen. Now, when I was a pastor of EEC, I had many wonderful experiences. But I remember... In 1993-94, I was marrying a couple in Beckton. And uh, he was English, and she was Chinese. And um, on that occasion, I preached from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, the very verse that Jesus quoted. And I said to the audience uh, gathered, about 100 of them, that uh, sex is from God, and Christians should have the best sex. And then one lady in the front said, Hallelujah! You know who she was? She was the grandmother <laughs> of the groom. She was 90 years old. And I said, hallelujah, and the whole church broke down completely. We want to celebrate married love. And sex is a very beautiful gift from God. Never sneer on it. Never crack jokes about it. It's pure. It's beautiful. It's God's gift. So here, marriage is taken highly. And then the two of them will become one, not only sexually, but in the way they make a decision. Think of a Chinese family. Husband and wife, married. The mother still, in Canada, they say, Hope Daya, still cannot uh, uh, come up to it. How come my, my darling son has now been taken over by a woman? Another woman, a stranger for that. So, he will always say to his son, son, I want you to do this. I want to make sure that you celebrate our birthdays and you give so much red packets, hong pao, you know, a, a year to us and so on. And then uh, the wife says, what? What about my parents? What about this? What about that? And uh, the mother just wants the son to obey her. 
But when you are married, you become one. You are on the side of your wife, not on your mother anymore. Do you get it? This is biblical teaching. All right? In other words, your mother or your father should not be controlling your marriage. You too have become a new unit and God has blessed that partnership. And then Jesus says what God has joined together and the word joined means like glue. What God has glued together, strong, adhesive. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder or let not man separate. For God, for Jesus, marriage is a permanent union. It's not a social contract. It's not take it or leave it when things go wrong. It's for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death us do part. The we Christians are notorious for our anti. We're anti-gays, some people say. Or we are anti-this, we are anti-that, and so on. But my question is what we pro. So I do not want to be like anti-divorce or anti-homosexuality. I want to be pro-marriage. Pro-good families and homes. Pro-values the scripture has written and taught us about. So don't just discuss divorce separately. Always go back to marriage. So let me just read in summary from message. Uh, same passage, and then you'll get the uh, gist of it from Eugene Patterson's rendering about uh, uh, divorce. Matthew 5, this is how uh, he wrote it. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are, quotation marks, legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress unless she herself has made herself an adulteress by her sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. So you can't use legal cover to mask moral failure. Then in chapter 19, which I read to you, this is how the message uh, puts it. Jesus said, uh, okay, haven't you read in your Bible the Creator originally made man and woman for each other, male and female. And because of this, a man leaves father and mother and is firmly bonded to his wife, becoming one flesh. No longer two bodies, but one. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, and no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. Moses, Jesus said, provided for divorce as a concession to your hard-heartedness. But it is not part of God's original plan. I'm holding you to the original plan, holding you liable for adultery if you divorce your faithful wife and then marry someone else. I make an exception only in cases where the spouse has committed adultery. Amen. So we can't use, as it were, words and legalities to justify our divorce position. But then I realize some of you would say, I'm divorced. That mean, does it mean I'm cursed by God? That I am no longer somebody of importance? No. Because God is a God of grace, but never justify why you were divorced. Because all your critics will say it takes two to tangle. Never, never justify why you are divorced or give reasons why your husband left you or why your wife left you. We can only look to God's grace, the God who forgives, the God who forgives those who are repentant, the God who touches the brokenhearted, the God who mends, the God who restores, and the Lord who heals. That's what we should be teaching. And when they get remarried again, make sure this time it's God bringing you together and you working together in your marriage. And what about those of you who are struggling with your marriage, thinking of a divorce or separation? The answer is, do not walk out, work out. Don't walk out, work it out with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now quickly, we come to the issue of 
oaths. And here, oaths also very important because in Jesus' day, many people were swearing, taking on oaths and so on by the, using the temple and so on. But you know in the Old Testament, the third commandment says, you must not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Jews are very good. They realize God's name is sacred. So you can't say, I swear by Almighty God. No Jew would say that. They weren't dare to say that. Or by the personal name, Yahweh. They would never do that. What happens? They would say, I swear, as Jesus mentioned, by heaven or by earth, or I swear by the hairs of my head. Now it's very interesting, in medieval England, the English people were known as the greatest swearers in the world. This is from history, all right? Not from me. And in those days, they would not swear by God. You know what they swear? By God's tooth. By God's eye. Huh? By God's belly. By God's fingers. They were swearing like that. Now today, people say, geez, swear word. Gee, for Jesus. Or crikey, Christ. We still use that. Because people like to swear. Of course, lots of people just use the word Jesus and so on. And we get very upset as Christians, so we ought to. That's taking God's name in vain. And here were these people doing these things. What about oaths? What about vows? Of course, in the Bible, it's clear that vows are meant to be kept. Whatever we say is a pledge and we are to keep our words. And that's very clear in the Bible. But then, you see, what we have to be very careful is not to play around with words. A lawyer friend was talking to me and I asked him about some of the tough cases as a barrister that he had to work through. I said, look, in the case of that person, you know, everyone knew he was a murderer. And uh, how come you want to defend him and so on? And how come he dared to swear in court that he didn't kill his cousin and of course uh, my friend said he asked the man the same question and what he asked did you kill your cousin he says no and you know what this man you know why he said that and meant that he says he said later on when he was found guilty later on he said when I said no I meant that I did not kill myself my, my cousin after I was arrested by the police can you see how deceptive, how horrible the mind can be, twisting things and so on. So here Jesus is saying now, be careful, do not demean or debase your word. And why do men take oaths anyway? Why do men and women swear by God's name or God's law or whatever? Why do they do it? Professor A.M. Hunter of Cambridge tells us, because, and he's right, all men are liars. All men and women, and women too, are prone to lying. And that's why oaths are needed. Otherwise, in court cases, uh, you're not sure whether the truth is being spoken or not. Is it wrong to swear as Christians? The answer is, if you rely on saying things like, I swear by the church, by the temple, uh, by heaven, by earth, by uh, my mother, you know, cross my heart. When you say cross my heart, I swear by my mother on her life that I didn't say that, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And Jesus says, that's not right. And of course, in Matthew 23, some of them were beginning to swear by the gold, the gift on the altar, and others on the altar. And Jesus said, look, what on earth are you doing? Uh, you mean to say that the, the gold on the altar is more important than the, the altar itself, than the house of God itself? What ridiculous uh, length are you going into to argue like that? Stop it! And for Jesus, the plain answer for people like him is, like us, for us today, is that let your yes be yes, let your no be no. In other words, let your word be your bond. Whatever you say, you do. You don't dodge out of it. You don't make excuses for it. Whatever you pledge, whatever you promise, you have to do. Let's close. Let's bring divorce, marriage, rather, and uh, oaths together. At your marriage service, you 
made an oath. You made vows. You exchanged vows, right? For better, for worse, richer, poorer, sickness and health, plenty and want and so on. You made a commitment. You can't dodge out of it. And if you, a Christian, can follow other people, and by the way, the divorce rates for Christians compared to non-Christians are only slightly lower in this country. Slightly lower. That's not good. And you can dodge out of these things, then something wrong. But can we end this way? I want to suggest to you that we must be a group of people that reflect our discipleship. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul says, in Jesus, we always find the yes of God. And we are Christians. We represent Jesus. That whatever we say, if we say we're going to sell, we're going to do this or do that, we do. We keep our word. We don't make excuses and try to run out of it. Of course, if we fail, we say, I'm sorry. Please forgive us. Forgive me. So today, as we end, I believe that God is saying something to Emmanuel Church. He wants people to renew their marriage vows. So if you're married, and I know all the forces that can come to attack your marital ties and so on, and split your homes and your firstborn and so on, and it's, it's good that we renew our vows. We say, yes, God, we're going to keep our vows no matter what happened. We want your grace. We can't do it ourselves. And one of the most moving things that I've seen was in this church. In 1997, 98, we had revival meetings here. And sometimes for four or five nights a week. And one occasion, I was sitting somewhere there, and I saw, as I turned around, when the altar call was made, a woman walking down there. And then a man walking around there. I didn't know who they were. But then when they walked up to uh, just after the uh, console, they sort of set eyes on each other. And then all of us suddenly heard a lot of shrieking, crying, laughter, when two of them began to embrace and hug and kiss each other. So that was a very unusual scene. But later on, we found out, Gerald Coates and I, we found out that two of them have been separated. Not divorced, yet, separated. Legally separated with a view to divorce. They've not seen each other for three, four years. But both of them were touched by the grace, the love of God. And they've come to Him. They didn't know they were in the service together because they came independently. But as they walked down here, the Holy Spirit brought them to see each other and they hugged, and I believe they were together again. That's what God wants to do, all right? None of us is perfect. Never think of walking out or destroying our marriage. Children are affected. Lots of people are affected, and most of all, God's name is affected. God says he hates divorce, but God also wants to love people and say, look, I want strong marriages in my kingdom. If you want to be salt and light, you really want to represent me, come, come. Have your ties renewed. So now, uh, as we close, we don't have very much time. I really like you, if you can, to stand where you are. If you're a couple, if you are separated, come down to your couple. And just for a minute or two, I just want to pray for you. I want to pray that with all the things ravaging, attacking marriages today, I want us to have marriages that are committed, strong, loving, are true born. So will you come? Couples, just come quickly. Come to the front or stand where you are. Uh, if your wife or husband is not here today because of good reasons, come up along. Two, we want to bless you. This is very important because we want to show to the principalities and powers, the heavenlies, that it's not about divorce that we want to fight about. Huh? Okay? It's about marriage, strong marriage, the ties that are lasting. Come, I get to get my darling wife to come up here. Yeah, you come and stand with me, sweetheart. And uh, <laughs> this is beautiful. Are there other couples? Okay, remember what the Lord says, okay? That when we are couples, we are one together. God has brought us together. And also thank God for people who have long marriages. I think you guys should thank God for us. We're going to have our golden 
anniversary very soon. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. So, the reason for saying that, not for you to praise us, but to say, yeah, God can keep a couple like them. We used to fight like cats and dogs, you know, in, in the early days of our marriages and so on. I will never admit my fault and so on. You know, God was so gracious that uh, she didn't walk out of the marriage, but uh, that he brought us together, that we learned to love each other and work together and so on. So God wants to do that for all of us, all our marriages. So let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And we thank you so much that you designed marriage. You do not want men to be alone, but you brought men and women together and made them one flesh. This was your divine provision and design. Forgive us, Lord, where we have grieved you by wanting the easy way out, by threatening divorce. Forgive us, Lord, those are terrible words. And forgive us, Lord, too, if we have divorced, first wife, first husband, Forgive us too if we were contributory in some ways to the cause of the divorce. But thank you for your grace. You long to pick us up, restore us, renew us. So help us to love you. Help us to uh, follow you and through our loving relationship, reflect something of the wonder and beauty of Christ and the church, of the purity, the splendor of that union. So thank you, Lord. We just look to you and we call on you, Holy Spirit, to pour your love. Yes, Lord. More, more, more. Lord, let your love be released now and your blessings from heaven on all these couples here that they will know your infilling grace and presence. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And to those of you who are single, don't be afraid to get married. If God calls you to get married, okay? Because God's grace can help us even through weaknesses and so on. So let's give the Lord a, 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 a thank offering. Thank you for all His grace, all His love. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for being part of our service this morning. We want to bless you and we will see you again next week. But if you are in need of uh, prayer, if you would like people to pray,